Welcome to Café Release, second times is the charm. Uh, I am joined today by uh, someone who was on Twitter and uh, asking, inviting people to engage with him online and uh, I seized the opportunity, opportunity to do so. Uh, Ian, could you introduce yourself to the viewers? Hi, I'm Ian Watson. I'm the community manager for Onyx Path Publishing and the content lead for the Trinity Continuum. Great. Uh, I've been uh, I've been checking on XPath and uh, uh, I got a copy of Aberrant. It's one of those games I had for a while, but I still have to run it. But uh, it looks really really cool. I got two ice breaking questions. The first one is: uh, Has your routine changed in any way under the the current uh, COVID nineteen uh, lockdown? My work routine, not so much, because uh, everyone from Onyx Path works at home. Uh, uh, Rich Thomas, the, the founder, um, he lives in uh, Philly, uh, Philadelphia, and I have literally never seen his house, and I've been working for the company for eight years, <laughs> so we're, we're all distributed everywhere. So in terms of working, things are the same, but in terms of personal life things are a little bit different I, I don't go out as often I you know try to make fewer but more frequent uh, more infrequent yes more infrequent uh, runs to the store than I usually do that sort of thing great and well I assume in that case you have not picked up any new skills or hobbies uh, as part of uh, the lockdown not really just more working but working is good. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I could afford to work at the moment. I'm unemployed, but uh, I got to take care of my son. Uh, that's uh, that's quite a challenge in, in these times. Uh, so uh, the big thing you're working on at Onyx at the moment, uh, is it Trinity? Is it the, the one you making the news? Yes. Uh, the Trinity Continue. Uh, it's uh, the... It's sort of the new edition of the original uh, Trinity, Aberrant, and Adventure games that came out in the uh, the late '90s, early 2000s from White Wolf. The core rulebook is it's a it's a brand new thing. Um, it's a, a modern day action adventure setting. So if you wanted to do uh, the Born Identity or Leverage or the A-Team, or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., or that sort of thing. You could do that with the core rules here. And then that expands into other settings, which might be more familiar to the uh, returning players from the 90s, like Aeon, which is the uh, 2120s uh, space opera se setting, or uh, Abert, which you mentioned, the, the superheroes game. And then we're doing Adventure, which is the 1930s pulp game, and uh, we recently announced we're doing a new one called Anima, which is uh, sort of uh, a combination of cyberpunk and lit RPG crammed together. So that should be fun. Cool. It seems like cyberpunk is getting more popular again at the moment. I heard a, a lot of mentions of it. Come, I guess it's related to the new video game coming out and, uh, and a few uh, movies also recently. That could be. Um, I've had Anima sitting in my head for most of the last eight years, so we're finally getting to do it. So I don't know if it, like, it, it just coincidentally happens to be popular right now, but I've been wanting to do it for a long time. So does that mean you have a writing role in Anima in addition to your uh, communication role at Onyx Path? Uh, no. Uh, what I do is, um, as the content lead, my role is I sort of create the, the universe and I've got it all sort of laid out in my head of how it's supposed to flow from one game to the next and how it all comes together. And then uh, Eddie and I um, act as developers and get all the other writers to actually write the material. I've got a, a how from Portugal, who's a game designer himself, is doing a superhero game called Heroes Modernos, but he's very interested in um, Trinity Continuum uh, Anima, and his, his question is, can you reveal more about it? 
we just announced it, so at the moment there's not a lot I can cover, but I'll, I'll do a little bit. Um, when you uh, when you think of cyberpunk, a lot of people think of William Gibson, and he famously said in uh, at the beginning of one of his novels, um, "The sky was the color of a television tuned to a dead channel." And how you think of that sort of um, defines almost two genres of cyberpunk. Now, originally, that was like the electric, dismal, gray snowstorm of, you know, TV static. But these days, when you turn a TV on to a dead channel, it's just bright blue. Uh, so uh, what I call sort of, for lack of a better term, dark cyberpunk uh, would be more of the, the gray snowstorm thing, like Blade Runner, even when it's daytime, it's nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where uh, the the sort of light cyberpunk, I guess, uh, would be something more like um, uh, Mirror's Edge or Remember Me or um, uh, similar games and settings uh, to that, where um, everything is bright and almost too clean, where the if there's a fascist government, they're just they're trying to almost literally whitewash everything by by making it perfect and pristine so, so it's a pristine world it's not it's it's still uh cyberpunk it's not uh falling in the slightly parallel genre of uh, solar punk is it uh it's it's crossing a bit with that like the the boundaries are fuzzy um it, it's not specifically one thing or another which we're pulling a lot of inspirations in for, from a lot of places well it's quite interesting cyberpunk it's uh well when you try to categorize something a bit like punk itself as a genre of music it's quite difficult to to pinpoint the the boundaries are quite blurry uh, mm -hmm. we, we were i was seeing a, a list of cyberpunk m movies recently and i thought it was fascinating how in our head, cyberpunk, it's kind of precise, but when you look at movies which match that, there are not that many movies which are exactly that. They, they sort on the side. Like, I guess Blade Runner is kind of, is it a noir movie or is it cyberpunk? And then you got you got stuff like The Matrix, which is, right. I guess it's a bit like Anima, The Matrix, because it's you don't really see the the trash and et, et cetera. Uh it, it is and it isn't. Uh, the Matrix itself looks kind of dingy and there's that sort of gr green over, sickly green overtone to everything. Um, but it does have that element of having the real world and the virtual world that you go into, which is uh, the other half of the equation that we're going into here. A, a lot of what's going on in the game is sort of split between the two worlds. You have the real world uh, which is the cyberpunk aspect, and then you have the virtual world, which is the the lit RPG aspect. So, do you have the the classic? Uh, let's say, what what do you play in Anima? Do you play the uh, you know the classic the muscle, the the hacker, the drone controller, the the face, or are things slightly different in terms of um, things that players can uh, can inter can uh, incarnate in in that world? We expect. Um, that people will probably be playing whatever they like playing. Uh, it, there, there's not going to be a specific hacker class exactly, uh, like there is in a lot of similar cyberpunk fiction, because everyone has access to glass, which is the, uh, the, the brain implant technology that lets you enter the virtual world. So anyone can be outside and anyone can be inside and you might even take different roles depending on where you are um like someone who's normally like a, a, a weak bookworm outside can become the tank when they they go inside uh so it should be really really interesting um I mentioned anima. There's also things like Tron or uh, the the hack sign anime. Uh, a, a lot of, I mean, everyone's familiar with that sort of thing where you know there's the virtual world that you go into and have adventures in there. So uh, it, it's 
it's digging into a lot of that sort of fiction. Cool. Uh, I'd like to run a, a campaign inspired for, by Sword Art Online, so that that might be the system uh, for me to to do so. I like the idea that everybody's connected because uh, the last cyberpunkish game uh, I played was Shadowrun, and we ended up with oh, and there goes the ra the hacker is doing his thing, and you have to wait while the hacker is doing his thing in the virtual space, and then oh no, the shaman is going into the astral plane. And you're waiting for for the shaman to be done, and oh, everybody in the real world, okay, we can play together uh, again. So, if people can play, everyone can play in the, the in the same playground and share different playground, and the rules can be inverted in playgrounds. That sounds like a a, a very dynamic uh, arrangement among players. Yeah, we didn't want to to make it feel like anyone had nothing to do at any given point. Uh, so either you're all uh, I mean, you can split up if you want to, but um, we we didn't want it to, to feel like you had to split up. So, so everyone's got something to do. So uh, you're you're the communication uh, officer for 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 that game and and others. Oh, did you approach the 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 PR for this game in a specific way in terms of? the way you, you go about it uh, on social media, or did you create specific content to, to reach people uh, online? Not yet. Um, ah. <laughs> Rich Rich has his, his plan for uh, how he wants to roll things out in terms of like how quickly we start talking about it and when we can talk about this and when we can talk about that. So I'm just following orders. <laughs> I told this week it was quite interesting and it hurts me to mention it because I think it's, it's all part of the plan but uh, uh, as a professional in that field what did you think of the I guess you can call it a campaign for uh, Miss Monopoly uh, I thought it was interesting it's, it's kind of a repeat of history that people tend to share what they love to hate rather than one, what they just love and I thought in terms of uh, communication it was well, it was interesting. I was wondering if the publicist for that thing was intentionally triggering people so the product would be shared absolutely everywhere, which which was the case. I mean, I'm following... Even people who are not into tabletop, like Lindsay Hellis, uh, she's a vlogger, she speaks about movies. Uh, everybody was sharing that game, uh, even though they were sharing it in a negative way. I don't know if you, you've seen that uh, ad. I, I have, but... Um... One of the things uh, that is often missed is that Hasbro gave, I think, something like a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to each of the girls featured in the ad. Yes, that's true. Yeah, uh, and and that's usually not mentioned. Um, and I think, other than that, it was just like I I don't think they intentionally meant to make it bad. I think it was just an ignorant slip up because we keep on seeing this sort of stumbling where hey you like pens well how about a pen for a woman that's pink it's meant for your dainty little fingers and like it's just so stupid and they just keep on making the same mistakes yeah i was and really wondering about that i'm, I'm probably paranoid uh, already I, i've read too many cyberpunk novels uh but uh, yeah, I was thinking, you know, that that was the plan. That was the plan to get people outraged because that that's when they share stuff. And I would not have heard of that game without that. It's it's amazing to think that you. I mean, I work in in design, com, uh, designed by committee, and I know how wrong can things go when you have a group of people. But still, I was like, really, it's not made on purpose. That's that's really where, especially with the. Uh, I don't know. It's it's nice, and at the same time, it's fitting that they were handing out money to these girls for the mm -hmm. invention. It's kind of it's a bit having it both ways. I find you outrage people, and then you say, "Yeah, but uh, see, I'm sincere because actually, I'm supporting a uh, uh, young ent entrepreneur." All right, I I think their hearts were in the right place, but I don't think the marketing team knew what to do necessarily with. Ms. Monopoly. Um, just like the, I don't know if you've seen the the Millennial Monopoly, um, where like the, the tagline written on the box was something like, you can't afford a house anyway. 
Yeah, and there was socialist monopoly also, which was uh, winning is for capitalists or something like that. So th those were intentionally, uh, well, I guess it's supposed to be parodies, but yeah, <laughs> a bit more than parodies for a lot of people. I, I think the teams that come up with these products and the teams that have to market them, they don't really communicate very much. So um, the, the marketing teams do the best they can, but I mean, when, when you have a product like that, what are you going to do? Yeah, but that's the thing that's a bit weird, you know, uh, I guess. I mean, I don't know the people personally involved in that, but it, it reminds me of uh, businesses in my own industry for which you have people working, but unlike other businesses, maybe it's not as much a passion job as it would be working for another <laughs> company. So, so like, and I wanted to work in, in tabletop gaming, but I work for As Asbro at working on Monopoly, which is, yeah, I guess I should be happy to, to be working in gaming, but yeah, it's kind of a, a weird ground to be sitting on, I assume that the, the passion might not be always there. I mean, I've seen that with video game, also people working on certain video games, which are, okay, you work in video game, but it's not, the people actually involved are not that passionate about the project they, they're there because they, they ended up there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm really, I, I pride myself to be the, the least knowledgeable podcaster in the hobby. So, uh, and I actually made a TikTok recently about my, how oh, much I ignored uh, about the, the history of something like uh, World of Darkness. Uh, what's the, the status of World of Darkness with Onyx Path? Do you, do you still publish games in that universe, which are not Vampire the Masquerade, or, or does that work? Yeah, um, uh, Paradox Interactive are the people who own the White Wolf IP, uh, but we license all of it from them. So we're producing material for Vampire 5th edition, which is the most recent edition. Uh, everything else is still in the 20th anniversary edition, which is sort of the last one back. Uh, so we're still doing Werewolf, we're still doing Mage, we're still doing Wraith, we're still doing Changeling. We also license from them Exalted, and we're doing a lot of work there. And we've got the Chronicles of Darkness, which is Vampire the Requiem, Werewolf the Forsaken, Mage the Awakening, and all of those game lines. So we're still doing everything. Um, uh, the, like, th there's some stuff where um, we're, we're not, we haven't done anything for a little while because there's like two, do two dozen different game lines and we can only put out so many things at a time. Um, but we have plans for a lot of things and it just it's just a matter of slotting them into the schedule and getting books approved by Paradox. Yeah, there's so much going on. I mean, sometimes I hear about some of them, I'm like, wow, I didn't even know about that specific one. Uh, I still have to play Promethean, the Mummy. I haven't even played uh, Hunter. Uh, I've played uh, a bit of Werewolf, a bit of Vampire, uh, right? I still need to, to try it. it I, I don't know if it's uh, uh, early to discuss stuff like that, but is the plan to bring everything in the fold of V5 or they, they remain separate game en entities in, in V20 or their current systems? Uh, there is a uh, Werewolf 5th edition, which is uh, currently in production. Um, Onyx Path, well, we we hope that we're going to be able to work on books for the edition, but um, just like Modifius uh, have sort of been licensed to oversee V5 as a game line, Hunter's Entertainment uh, have been licensed to oversee Werewolf 5th edition. So they're going to be doing the core rulebook, and we would love to help them out and uh, make some supplements for Werewolf 5th edition when the time comes. I don't know about any of the other game lines in the World of Darkness. I assume eventually they'll all get 5th edition uh, compatible books, but for the moment we're just doing our thing. Um, we've got the Kickstarter running right now for uh, the Technocracy Reloaded, which is for Mage's 20th anniversary edition. So we're, we're still doing books for Mage for 20th anniversary edition for now. We have a, there's a very, well, uh, not popular in terms of number, but uh, 
uh, at London RPG Community, which is one of our clubs. Uh, we got Dan Marriott running a little campaign of Mage, and it's uh, it's proven very uh, a big success with the the players. Uh, I'd I'd like to to join that table at some point. That that would be cool. So it's it's a very wide catalog so how do you how do you manage uh communicating about all of that N not at once but in sequence so do we have, do we have a, a big timeline of plan or so we're moving on this one so this is a bracket for anima and then we'll move on to the bracket for promethean and then so on so on or, or do you cope with so much yeah such a large catalog of uh, content well we have a lot of freelancers um we have um, if you've listened to the Onyx Pathcast, uh, you're probably familiar with our three in-house developers. There's uh, Eddie Webb, who oversees most of the um, sort of the non-White Wolf Onyx Path games. Then you have... Uh, Oops, we lost you for a second. Hmm. Each project has their own developer. Uh, so a given book will be developed by Megan Fitzgerald or Travis Legg. And so since we have a lot of freelancers that we hire, we have just two dozen books up in the air at any given point at various stages of development. So we don't really block things out. It's just whatever's ready, whenever. Okay, so you, you, leave, you leave time for things to come to fruition uh, at their own pace, uh, I assume. Yeah. Cool. Have you been? Uh, I remember what was it called? Uh, I think it was called Swallows of the South. Uh, back when there was a RPG Academy Network, it was a Exalted podcast, and you mentioned the Onyx podcast. Uh, are you keeping an eye on uh, uh, what streams are taking place and podcasts are taking place uh, using your games? Uh, uh I spend more of my time on Twitch than uh, with podcasts because um, just having just the audio, I, I don't really absorb what's going on as easily, but having something to look at, even if I'm not immediately paying attention, I, I still get like a much better idea of what's happening. So I usually hang out on, on Twitch and uh, you know chat with people who are playing one of our games. Uh, any uh, favorites? The, the Devil's Luck game. Yeah, the Devil's Luck Gaming Crew, uh, they have a long-running uh, Scarlands show called Pirates of Bloodwater, and they've uh, they've taken a, a brief hiatus from that, and they're doing one called Fractured Territories, which is Werewolf the Forsaken, and they they dress up, they they have like different set dressing, so they really go like the whole way. It's not just a bunch of people sitting around a table. They they actually. Like really get into it. It's fun to watch. Oh wow! So that's something like uh, LA by night, and they they all sit in the same room uh, together, or uh, they they do when they can. They haven't been doing that uh, as much lately. Most of them live in one house, so they can um, they can all sit together. But there's one of them who doesn't live with them, so they they call in and have a separate little window. Um, but <laughs> it, it's fun. That's quite a host share to imagine. Uh, not only a whole bunch of uh, tabletop RPG fans living together, but uh, streamers <laughs> with their own little studio. That's very cool. Uh, hey, I wanna... um... Yep. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, for the Pirates of Bloodwater uh, game, um, they wanted, because it's like a, a, a seagoing game they they wanted something cool like a map in the background and we have a map of the setting but uh none of the stuff that we normally sell was big enough for them because they wanted something you know big to cover their entire wall so uh our art director actually sent them the file and they had printed off a giant version of the map which is behind them while they're streaming the whole time <laughs> that's really amazing nice to see. that's really cool i need to check them out uh, I was wondering, I was, yeah, uh, th there was this, um, uh, I was wondering something uh, now and then regarding uh, how famous some role-playing games are versus another, and uh, 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 I was wondering what you would think uh, about this idea. 
I was wondering to what point, to, to what extent something like Dungeons and Dragons was so famous because they had their, their infamous moment with the satanic panic. And sometimes when I, I was seeing, uh, well, Vampire the Masquerade, which when I started was much more popular than Dungeons and Ra Dragons, actually, it was the, the late 90s, it was before 3 and 3.5 came out. But sometimes I'm wondering, should, would having a name famous moment of its own for something like Vampire the Masquerade would actually have helped a game like that make its way into the the popular culture and the knowledge of of people beyond the people who play uh, those games because I keep being frustrated by the fact that yeah people will post there there will be mainstream media posts saying Dungeons and Dragons is helping kids learn this and that and it's always it's like it's the name of the the hobby like we're doing Dungeons and Dragons Vampire the Masquerade Dungeons and the Dragons Star Trek rather than tabletop roping game so I don't know what's your view on that do you think a uh, bad publicity can be good publicity in the medium to long term well vampire did sort of get its own version of that um in uh 1996 um rod farrell killed what was it um Naomi Ruth Queen and Richard Wendorf were found by their daughter beaten to death in their Eustace home and uh, Rod Farrell uh, claimed he was part of a vampire cult because he and his friends played Vampire the Masquerade. Wow, I wasn't uh, aware of that. So uh, if you look at a lot of uh, World of Darkness books from the 90s after that point, there's always a disclaimer in the front saying, hey, this is fiction. Don't do this in real life. And those disclaimers are specifically because of the Rod Feral murders. Wow. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Vampire had its its moment uh, of of controversy, and um, it was not the best of attention. But they they sort of weathered that as best they could, and eventually people forgot about it and ignored it. Well, it's good uh, in, in in that case, uh, I assume. Uh, any question in the chat room? We got a few people in the chat room. Uh, uh, I was thinking of something else. Is there something you want you wish to talk about? Because you know it's a very free format. Uh, I created this this specific one uh, spin-off show in order to to have people to have conversations with. It was. Sure. Did you um, ha did you had interesting any other interesting conversations uh, following your tweet? Because again, uh, I contacted you because you you invited people to to reach out in this term, time of isolation. So have you encountered uh, anyone nice uh, in the meantime? I I do have a few interviews lined up, but you're the first, so thank you. <laughs> um. Uh. So I I guess that tweet was a success. Uh, as for other projects I'm doing, um, I'm one of the co-developers on the upcoming Victorian Mage. So if you like the Mage the Ascension setting, but you'd like to take it to the Victorian era, we're doing that. Cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing I don't know. Uh, that, that's the thing which frustrates me with Vampire a bit. Of course, there's Dark Age, but the, the bit which mm -hmm. annoyed me compared to another game uh, from the 90s, Nephilim, a uh, French mm. game. There, there was a US version, but uh, yeah, it was way more popular in France. Was that uh, I, when I w want to play a vampire, I'd like to play an old vampire because I'm immortal and I'd like to engage with the the history. But the the system tells me no, you cannot because you you'd be overpowered compared compared to the others. But I, I'm I'm a sucker for any setting in different times and ages uh, of history. So Major uh, Victoria, so it's it's set in the UK then, or is it uh, all, ar all around the world? Uh, I mean, obviously there is going to be some focus on the UK because it's the Victorian age, Queen Victoria. Um, but it, the, the wider focus is on Europe and then the rest of the world. So th there is coverage for a lot of stuff, but um, there, there's more sort of detail as you get closer to the UK. 
Cool. Do, will you have? Uh, I mean, what is it going to look like? Is it, is it going to be a book which going to cover a number of lo locations, or do you going to have? I don't know equivalents of uh, Chicago by night, but I mean, I guess it would be Chicago by gaslight or things like that. Different supplements covering different areas of the world. Uh, I don't know if we have plans for any supplements yet. That will probably come out of the Kickstarter. Uh, but we do have like a, a section on here's what the world looks like, just little slices of here's what Eastern Europe looks like, here's what Africa looks like, just so people get a, a decent idea of what's going on in the rest of the world. Because one of our core themes is uh, colonialization. And I mean, that's that's a big deal, especially in the Victorian period. And as they say that you know the sun never sleeps on the British Empire because Britain and a lot of other uh, European countries just had all of these colonies going on and sort of over overriding the the, the native cultures of those areas um, and that that creates a lot of conflict and while all of that is going on the old order of reason is turning itself into the technocratic union so there's a lot of really interesting things happening in that time period that we can dig into. It reminds me uh, a book by uh, Neil, is it Neil Stephenson? His name, um, it's called The Diamond Age. And it's, it's a cyberpunk book, but in a future where people congregated, not by nations, but by sort of uh, uh, culture slash point of views. And one of the, the major... Uh, uh, conglomerate is one which is inspired by the Victorian age, but at the mm -hmm. age of nanotechs. But you have a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in, yeah, a lot of people who engage with high technology, but they try to do it with a nostalgia for the Victorian age and a, a form of classism uh, and so on. But yeah, it's definitely an interesting time for for major seeing the, the relationship to science and technology becomes so much stronger in the daily life of people compared to to what was before mm -hmm. have you played in the in that game or, or at the, uh, already or what are you playing at the moment are you running playing at the moment nothing um nothing i i yeah i don't get a lot of chance to play as, as much as i would like um every now and then um, what with all the Twitch streams that we have going on during the week, I, I I keep on thinking of maybe joining one of them, and then I get busy doing something else, so I don't get the chance. Well, you need uh, a That's big, like... you need to get yourself a big strong NPC in one of those campaigns and just uh, make a cameo, uh, no, and then and wreck the the things for for the players. That's not a bad idea, actually. <laughs> I could probably do that. Just walk in once, mess things up, and then walk out again. Yeah, you, you do your Chris Perkins. You you come, you play a character even for thirty minutes, and and then you go, uh, and uh, things are, things are are sorted. Uh, it was is there? What would that be if you if you had the time to run just one of those games? Uh, would that be Anima or something else? What do you would you have already an idea for an adventure or a campaign you you wish you had time to run? Uh? I would love to be able to run my game uh, and any of the Trinity Continuum games uh, because it took me about eight years to get this published. I, I, Rich asked me to start working on it around the time Onyx Path was founded, which is 2012. So it took a long time to get these books done and out the door. And I am so happy that they're available to the public now. Uh, so I would love to be able to run one of them or play in one of them. That would be great. Um, but so far, I haven't had the time, but we'll see. Hopefully that changes. Yeah, it can be time demanding. Uh, it's it's also an interesting experience to run something you, you worked on. Uh, I'm I'm in the process of doing that at the moment. I'm creating my, my very first own game. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a short story game, so I don't have any prep. And uh, the sessions can be are usually less than an hour, so <laughs> I make my life, my own life, quite easy. Yeah, yeah my uh, my brother uh, is 
as a sidekick, he, he's designing some uh, board games and card games. And it's easy for him to play because, you know, you just put the board out, you, you play 15 minutes and then you're done. I, I don't have that luxury. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see if that changes in the future. Is that something you had in mind when designing your game? Because I, I see there's a tendency with a growing number of games to, to consider the fact that, well, for a lot of us, a, a lot, a core, I mean, there's been some statistics recently showing that more and more younger players are, are coming to the hobby and that's great, but still I find people are not as available to prep and play long sessions. Is that something you, you took into consideration when uh, uh, designing your, your game compared to, to stuff which were designed uh, in the late 90s? I don't think so. I mean, a lot of us, as we get older, we just have less time for this sort of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's almost easier to find a game than it's ever been before because you have the internet. So I don't think the number of games has been going down, like the games that people are, are playing. Uh, I, I think it's actually been going up. Uh, uh, D&D 5th edition is the most popular, like the biggest selling D&D ever. And there's a reason for that. Uh, not just because D&D 5th edition is good, but because it's, it's hitting the market at the right time where a lot of people are able to play uh, that, that maybe couldn't before because the technology wasn't in place for it. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't do any, any designing um, thinking that people were going to be consuming the medium in a different way necessarily. Uh, I just assumed if people want to play, they're going to find a way to play. Cool. So you don't think that D and D fifth edition, for instance, uh, they, they sort of made themselves a bit more approachable and slightly simpler than uh, uh, fourth, maybe a bit, and uh, especially three point five were. Oh, I'm I'm not saying D and D fifth edition isn't a good game. I'm just saying that its popularity isn't just because it's a good game. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um. I never got the chance to play 4th edition. I, I did play some 3rd edition and 3.5, and I like 5th edition better. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's time D&D got rid of a lot of its baggage, but I know there are a lot of old school players who, you know, they need to have their, their six ability scores and they need to have their saving throws. Uh, I think D&D could do better without them, but... Um, yeah, they, they, they still need to, to bring in a lot of that old crowd too. Yeah, I wonder Yeah, I wonder how, how long 5th is going to last. Uh, I think they, they learned their lesson from 3, 3.5 and then jumping to 4th that they should not be... Yeah, they sh the time between editions should be as long as possible. So I assume they will going to try to enjoy their 5th for a very long time. <laughs> But I hope so. I wonder what uh, what the D and D sixth edition when when it would be happen and uh, what it would be like. I think it yeah it would be quite quite weird. Uh, usually I try to encourage yeah people to <laughs> if they want D and D five to be slightly different to maybe try a different game. <laughs> a lot of people are playing uh, D and D and a lot of people are playing only D and D. But uh, that's my own. Uh, I mean, it's fine, but uh, I like D&D, but sometimes I, I regret, again, the late 90s when the landscape was much more balanced, because, uh, at least in my experience in France and Belgium, uh, Vampire the Masquerade dominated. The, the question was not, well, do you play Vampire the Masquerade? The question was, do you play Chicago by night or do you play ba Paris by night? Because everybody played Vampire, but... Right. Even though it was still much more balanced between Vampire and RuneQuest and Star Wars D6 and a bit later Legends of the Five Rings than, than currently it is where you've got, I don't know, 70 to 80% of the people playing Dungeons and & Dragons and then the the rest is uh, of the pie chart is you need to zoom on it to see uh, who's playing uh, V5, V20 right. uh, <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, so I, I find, I like I like. Oh, yeah, I like people enjoying different things. I don't like when there's a huge player in the in the middle. 
Uh, I do you do you sometimes come to to the UK to uh, present your games? Uh, I'm, I don't think uh, Onyx Path is usually represented at UK Games Expo, which is not happening this year. So, but uh... Uh, we do go to UK Games Expo. Usually, oh. it's uh, usually it's just Matthew, but uh, I think uh, Matt McElroy, our um, our managing developer, editor, managing editor. I forget his title. Uh, I think he goes over there from time to time too, um, but we don't have a like a big presence uh, like we do at at, uh, at some of the conventions over here, most, because most of us are over here, so it's just easier. Um, but yeah, Matthew Dawkins lives in the UK, so he oh. goes to UK Games Expo when he can. Um, uh, I've interviewed quite a few people uh, who were trying new format to to work with the lockdown so having online conventions is it something you you've been aware of or looking into in any way uh yeah our our friends at gehenna gaming um ran virtual horror con a few weeks ago and it was it was a lot of fun and they did it with about two weeks prep they, they came up with the idea let's run a convention and then they ran a convention and I don't know how they did it, but it, it, they pulled it off like really well. Uh, they had games running on, uh, mostly panels running on their Twitch channel, and then their games would be running on YouTube. So you could sort of switch back and forth and uh, look at whichever you preferred. And it was running almost 24 hours a day for about like three days. It was crazy. Uh, in our recent Monday Meeting Notes blog, um, Rich has uh, asked people, like, hey, we're maybe thinking of doing an online convention. What sort of thing would you like to see? So if, if people have anything that they'd want to see from a virtual Onyx Path convention, uh, head on over to the Onyx Path blog and, and leave your comments. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's it's really cool because it's the uh, it's the birth of a new format. So uh, there's a lot of uh, invention going on. Actually, we we had an episode with Chris Henley from Darker Days Radio who, who came to to talk about Virtual Oricon, uh, with to which I did not I did not take part to Virtual Oricon because on that weekend I think we had three different online conventions when the when the lockdown oh, wow. started. Uh, people who are into conventions sort of kind of rushed and made amazing things in a in a few weeks. So, yeah, there was there was one I don't remember the name, uh, which was in Ohio. I mean, the the people doing it were based in Ohio, and I uh, took part to one uh, called CyberConf, which was uh, a French one. But the, yeah, it's amazing what they did with Discord. They had a little chat room for each publisher or game designer, so you could show up in a chat room say, like you would show up at a booth at a convention and, and ask you, oh, so what is your game about? Oh, well, welcome to my booth. Uh, I'm going to tell you all about it. And then in the meantime, we're running a, a Twitch stream continuously with panels and in between having a, what they call a free radio where you had just two hosts improvising stuff and having come, like like you have on a uh, FM or AM radio with people calling in and you say, oh, so uh, what do you think of the situation uh, and so on. Uh, I'm very curious to see all these things will will have second editions which are improved uh, and so on. But uh, yeah, if if uh, yourself uh, on XPath is organizing one, that that's very exciting too to see a publisher move into uh, into the field. Because uh. I mean, every year uh, we we have like new books we want to announce or whatever. And we usually save those for conventions. And now that there are no more conventions, what are we going to do? Do we just post about it on our blog or do we want to make an event out of it? So let's try to do a convention and see what we can do there. I think it's a very good initiative. We got a question from a podcaster. The, we got Richard from the D20 Future Show who was asking what makes a great vampire adventure and how do Onyx Path write publishable adventures? Um, for vampire specifically, we haven't really done any 
adventures except um, what's in Chicago by Night. Um, and I think what makes a good vampire adventure uh, is really digging into not just the the history of this setting, but the themes of the game. You, you really want to, to reinforce those. Uh, so the, the big event that happens in Chicago by night is uh, the La Sombra, uh, one of the, the vampire clans who are traditionally associated with the Sabbat. They're leaving the Sabbat and trying to join the Camarilla. And wow. that's, a, that's a big deal. Um, and Yes, the Camarilla, I'm sure, would love to have a powerful clan like the La Sombra, but also they've been enemies for 500 years. So <laughs> uh, I cannot how see are they every going... everybody not being happy about that. <laughs> right, exactly. How are they going to, to, like, what concessions are they going to ask of the La Sombra if they want to join? Uh, how are the La Sombra going to react to that? Are, are they going to say, no, that's too much, we, we don't want to anymore? Or are they going to say... No, it's worth it to join, uh, and any sacrifice that we need to to undergo is worth it to to join up with the Camarilla. So there, there's that that interesting um, sort of negotiation space on what exactly the Camarilla is going to ask of the La Sombra and what the La Sombra are going to do about it. I can imagine it could create at least uh, to some extent a, a schism among the La Sombra and some of them saying, well, uh, we're going to do our own thing and going to become uh, anti-La Sombra. I don't know if those were, were a thing and uh, we'll be the La Sombra, we'll remain with uh, the Sabbath. It, it actually reminds... Uh, yep, go ahead. The, the book says about while all of the clan leadership is trying to join the Camarilla, uh, the, among the clan as a whole, about 50% are going with the Camarilla and 50% probably staying with the Sabbat. So th there is a lot, of, a lot of that negotiation of who's better for us. <laughs> it reminds me, uh, we mentioned uh, Darker Days Radio and Virtual Law Work, and it reminds me of a question I asked him at the time. Uh, so th there, are, there are real life events which don't really need, even big ones which don't really need to, to make their way in the the fantasy realm of the games we play, but uh, the one we see right now is such massive scale on a global scale, and uh, and uh, so do you? What do you think it's going to be like for the the world of uh, world of darkness to witness those events? Uh, have you ever had uh, any heard any discussion about okay, what what do we do with this? Do we just overlook it completely or? Is there something happening, and uh, not not necessarily meaning the, the 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 reason for the event would come from you know a fantasy or, but uh, yeah, what is it like to be a vampire? I cannot hunt anymore. Nobody's outside, or at least not enough people. I'm not sure how we're going to treat it because it is a big event, and I don't think we can just ignore it. But on the same token. Um, Back in 2001, uh, New York City by Night came out, and um, it had been in production for a long time, but just because of the way everything worked out, it came out just after the September 11th attacks. So uh, Justin Achille, the vampire developer at the time, put it in a sidebar saying, like, this was a terrible thing that happened, and humans did it please don't turn it into a vampire plot because that doesn't respect, you know, the actual people who lost their lives. So I don't like it. If, if we cover it in one of the game books, um, I don't think we, we'd want to go in the direction of, you know, this is a infection invented by Pentex or vampires or whatever. That's nonsensical. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's that's disrespectful, and we don't want to do that. Uh, we do have, uh, for Chronicles of Darkness, we have uh, the Contagion Chronicle going on right now. And while the Contagion Chronicle is not about COVID-19, um, it's another thing that was just in production 
at the right or wrong time, depending on how you want to look at it. So um, I'm sure you could probably use a lot of the material in there as inspiration for running a game in the middle of a, a pandemic. Um, but yeah, it, it remains to be seen if we put it in the books and if so, how we're going to put it into books. We're too close to the event uh, at the same time. It's, you know, we, 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 right. we don't know what it's going to be like when we resume, uh, quotation, air quotes, normal life. So so I, I imagine it's difficult to, to en uh, engage with it in world building. Right. It's not something I don't think we'd want to do now. Uh, but Like we'd want to wait, you know, a year or two just to see sort of how things change, what happens to the world. Um, in, in a world where, where the pandemic has happened, not while a pandemic is happening. Uh, so yeah, it, it might take some time before we make that kind of decision, but it's, it's not one we're going to make lightly, certainly. Great, uh, it's gonna be about time for me to wake up my son from his nap, so meaning we're drawing to, to okay. a close. Uh, is there one last thing you, you wish to discuss or plug? Uh, the Technocracy Reloaded Kickstarter is currently running. Um, we we hit 100% funding within the first 45 minutes. So from here on out, it's it's all, thank you. Uh, we're at about, I don't know, 400% funding now. So from here uh, for the next two, three weeks, it's, it's all going to be stretch gold material. So if you like Mage, if you like the Technocracy, please check out our Kickstarter. Yeah, I recommend everyone does that. Uh... Uh, I need to play more mage. <sighs> but yeah, time, availabilities. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Ian. Uh, where can people find you? And uh, yeah, that, that is a goodbye. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Von Aether, which is under my name right now, V-O-N-A-E-T-H-E-R. And on Facebook, I can be found at ianaawatson.creative uh, as as my page's name and I don't update it as often as I do Twitter but every now and then I throw something out there that I'm playing around with Amazing Thank you so much for joining and uh, I wish you the best with your next interviews and for your Mage Kickstarter I'm sure it's going to be a, a great success and uh, yeah Cheers, bye everyone <laughs>